love it. Dun-dun. Don't you just love it? Dun. How many people say to you every day, here, take over? <laughs> yep. Yeah, another Myrtle week. So last week was, um, and I apologize last week that I, I tried to come back for conversation after and uh, wasn't able to. Uh, today I'll be hanging out. Um, but last week, so this three-part series is it's titled The Danger of a Single Story because a single story is a dangerous thing. Uh, and last week was, you know, a little bit, I mean, you can't cover all of Myrtle Fillmore in three talks, um, um, uh, not even in six or 10, um, but, but using um, Myrtle Fillmore, co-founder of Unity, as um, um, to, to just to introduce, to uh, take in the idea of the danger of a single story. And just as a, um, just to, you know, connect to last week, what what I was referring to, you know, when I when I talk about the danger of a single story is uh, most people know or believe, um, um, you know, what they know about Myrtle and what's kind of happened in Unity over the decades is that there's these two books, How to Let God Help You and Myrtle Fillmore's Healing Letters. And people get this, this is who Myrtle is. And, and they create, you know, what the brain does, this is just a biological thing. When it doesn't have information, it fills in the holes. It just fills in the blank spaces. That's what we do. Um, and so we create stories um, that um, may or may, may not be factually true. Um, there may be some, you know, what I would call myth. And myth is not a bad thing. A myth generally has some truth in it, like T, capital T truth. Um, but, but it's also how we get stereotypes. And again, stereotypes um, tend to have an element of truth in them. Um, but, um, um, but it's not, but uh, a stereotype is, you know, it really becomes very dangerous when you just sort of lump some, some understanding on a whole group of people. Um, and yet we do it all the time in our unconscious, unexamined assumptions. So when, when I talk about the danger of a single story, I'm, I'm really inviting us um, uh, into look at our unexamined, unconscious assumptions and to, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And so someone kind of has to point it out. Like I always, I always have to laugh. It's like when someone says, well, make the unconscious conscious. Well, how can I do that? It's unconscious. You know, <laughs> there's always a pause for me. But being in these kind of conversations and doing a lot of, um, you know, a lot of education over the years and a lot of research, I, I'm fortunate enough to live right by Unity Village, which is the archive. So I've, I've been able to, um, to look at, you know, hundreds and hundreds of letters that Myrtle wrote. Um, and the beauty of it is that, that we don't have in those two books is you have the letters that someone wrote to Myrtle. And so you can see what the person wrote to her and then you can see her response, which adds a huge dimension to this woman that there's a lot of things that people don't know. Um, it's interesting, I do have to back up a little bit and um, just in terms of the danger of a single story is when we think about Mother's Day, we think about mother apostrophe S you know, and, and most people know it as that, as a singular, um, as a day to, to honor mother, to honor mothers. But it actually began earlier, you know, and that began in 1908. Mother's Day, S apostrophe as a plural, began 40 years before that. Um, and it was by an American woman that was encouraging women to take control of politics from men um, it was after the Franco-Prussian War. It was after the Civil War here in the United States. So it, it wasn't originally designed for us to, to be nice to our mothers um, and other, and I love that slide you had of all the different kinds of mothers. And, and even with that, it's incomplete. Um, but it was, it was designed uh, to be part of the women's effort to gain power, to have freedom, to, to make a change in modern society. So, I'll just offer that up to you here in the U.S. Take that with you. Uh, maybe expand how um, you know how you see Mother's Day um, and women in general, um, whether cisgender or trans or um, non-binary or you know however someone ide identifies um, gender, because um, 
mothers come in as Marilyn slideshow come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and and ages and pick a social identity mothers come in that form and so there's one little factoid the other little factoid about mothers is that Myrtle Fillmore didn't really uh it wasn't her favorite thing to be a mother um she had three boys um, the middle one died young in his mid thirties of diabetes. Uh, but it wasn't, she always, when you start looking at, at lots of, um, you know, the things that are in the archives and her own, some of her own personal writings, it's not that she didn't love her children, but she wasn't really very doting or nurturing. She wasn't the, at that time, right? If you think back to a hundred years ago, 120, 130 years ago, she really didn't fit the mold of cooking for the family, you know, she didn't, she wasn't, um, she just always worried about being a good mother. And that went through her whole life that she didn't, you know, she did eventually, um, you know, she made peace with it in a way, but it wasn't, but she also was just, you know, one of the things we hear, and I talked about this last week, we hear this story that Myrtle cured herself of tuberculosis in two years, which is one of those cultural myths, there's some elements of truth in it, um, but we don't actually know what she had because she she tells her own story in different ways. Um, but that's, for me, that's not the hot issue, whether or not it, well, it had to be tuberculosis and in two years. What we do know is that she had a lot of symptoms that were referred to as tubercular conditions that today we might call you know, irritable bowel syndrome or arthritis or migraine headaches or, you know, panic disorder, you know, whatever. But she did in, you know, by engaging in the discipline of a spiritual practice and the healing and, and, you know, I talked about this last week, I think I did. Um, you know, it's one of those where, what did I do yesterday? I think I did that yesterday. Did I say that last week? You know, that was a sidebar, sorry, scroll moment. Um, so, uh, but since I'm talking about Myrtle Fillmore teacher, there's gonna be squirrel moments because that's what teachers do as far as I'm concerned. So, but I, but for me, the bigger picture around Myrtle Fillmore from thousands of hours that I've spent with her, her writings and, and lots of different things and things people wrote about her was um, in terms of healing was that there was, you know, a couple years of some solid discipline and practice. And so a lot of these symptoms she had certainly you know, went by the wayside, but it wasn't everything went away in two years. There's other writings that she has that, so the worry thing, the anxiety thing actually shows up periodically once in a while. Um, but the, the, for me, the point really is the discipline, <clears throat> the practice, the engaging with principles and changing. Maybe this needs a little bit of shifting and changing, not starting here, do this and don't ever change it but rather because of the teacher in her, um, you know, what am I learning? What's, what are the, you know, what are some of the outcomes of this? And what, you know, where, where am I going with these teachings? And how, how am I using them? And how are they impacting? And how am I engaging? Because she's very clear, it's body, mind, and spirit, right? It's, it's our whole being that has to engage. And that there's, you know, we do, you know, our prayer work very often is internal, but there's the external. You have to be in action, which I'm going to disagree with you, Marilyn. It's not silence. It's actually physical bodily movement action. That's being in action. Just sitting in the silence with something is not action. That's the... Um, the prayer part. She's very clear, though, that for healing, and this is where the teacher comes in, she, when she equates healing to mathematical equations, I'm like, okay, this woman is a teacher. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, she, um, she just, uh, you know, in any, <clears throat> any opportunity she has, she's going to insert a little bit of knowledge, right, or a lot. She's going to give her thoughts on something and she's going to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, try to put it in a context that makes sense for us. Um, and that's what she did with her own work. Um, that's what she did with her own, um, her own healing story. Um, but it's, so she, and she literally was a teacher. <clears throat> she went to, I think I mentioned this last week, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Um, she went to a uh, 
Oberlin College, which uh, in Ohio, which was the first university to allow women um, to study. And she um, took the courses for women to be teachers. And then she um, and then she um, and she also did an enormous amount of reading, you know, of her own. People often talk about Charles Fillmore, co-founder, you know, her husband, who did a lot of reading and a lot of study, but she did as well. Um, she does reference in, in her writings and in her letters other, other lessons from other people. She, she refers to the Lankavatara Sutras, with, and she refers to Bhagavad Gita. She, she refers to people like Samuel Hageman and Will Levington Comfort, and she talks about people that she read in school and other writers that were, you know, contemporaries that we don't know who they are today, but if you start poking around... Mm -hmm. You you kind of you what emerges is this picture of people that were thinking the same way she was and doing the same practices. In fact, there's a one gentleman I mentioned, Samuel Hageman, has a whole document that's called the Silence um, that that was written long before Charles and Myrtle started talking about the Silence. So it's you know it doesn't it's there's a lot of these ideas around. Um, you know, healing that uh, that don't aren't just originate with you know with Charles or or with Myrtle Fillmore, but rather you know are very much influenced by other other sources, and then you kind of take it on, right? You you oh that's interesting. Let me take that on, and that's that's what she um, uh, I think is one of the things that. So yes, there's this physical healing that goes on for her. And I think her, in terms of the teacher, um, she's, there's this two, there's almost this paradoxical thing about being a teacher is one, she's going to impart information, like her own thoughts, her own um, process, her own um, experience, right? And then at the same time, she's going to introduce something to, there's the teaching, which is the imparting the information. And then the other part of teaching is the, is the word education which the Latin for education is educare, which means to draw out, right? So she's giving you information and then something else to help you draw out um, from within you, your own wisdom. She's very clear that you have your own wisdom, that, that she's very clear that I'm not the, the end all and be all, right? That here's what I know, here's what I've learned. Um, and, so one and one of my favorite um, uh, favorite ways that she um, um, has this show up is she does this. She has this. Um, oh, now where did it go? Um, she has a, a quote from. Um, oh, did I? I close it down. Why would I do that? She she someone writes to her. So. Let me back up. So part of her teaching is that people are writing to her and the, the letters that they're writing, they're addressing the chaos in their lives, right? So Mer if you're not familiar, I should probably add a little bit. So Myrtle Fillmore, in doing her own, you know, individual work, she, uh, in 1878, had, she, she writes herself and it's in, I think it's in, how do I God help you? Um, Honestly, I don't remember which book. It's in Healing Letters or How to Let God Help You. But she writes about the state of her life in around 1878. And everything had just gone to crap. You know, there was no money. Everybody was sick. She was really sick. There was, you know, they were just, you know, constantly moving. And um, just, you know, things were just not good. And she writes about it. And um, she then, um, you know, it was wasn't long after that, that, um, you know, discovering, going to a, a lecture and hearing about the power of the mind to heal the body and, and, uh, and then taking it on herself. So she, and then next thing you know, she's offering prayer support to others, and then people are writing to her. So it really, she never set out to create a ministry. Um, she was sharing, she was teaching, Right. She went to Oberlin College to be a teacher, certified teacher. Then she goes to and is in, you know, one room schoolhouse kind of settings in Texas, here in the USA, in Missouri, in Colorado. 
past. And um, she um, and is doing just that and very methodical. That's the thing about uh, teaching in the traditional sense. It's very methodical. You have your lesson plan. You do this and you do this and you do this. But I think what's interesting to remember is that in the context that she was in, the time and the culture, she would have had to be teaching children of all different ages at the same time right? You're sitting in a one-room schoolhouse. So having to get creative in how do I get across, how do I teach this, this idea about mathematics or this idea about history and reach the child that's six and the child that's 14, right? So how do I sort of navigate through that? And, um, and so she, um, I think that that really helped her when it came time, this is my own opinion, that when it came time to write letters, that she had this ability to just meet someone where they're at and use sort of everyday things to talk to someone, to address the chaos of their day. Because she was, she was responding to people talking about disease, whether it was physical bodily disease or mental illness, about poverty, alcoholism, um, marital challenges. She had women writing to her, you know, I don't want to sleep with my husband, but he's, he want, you know, um, but how, so how do I navigate that? Um, child rearing, uh, environmental issues. If you know, if the more you read about Myrtle Fillmore, the more you read that and understand that she's very connected to earth. Um, you know, she talks about our soul and our body, our God's garden. Um, and, um, you know, it's always springtime in the soul. Um, it's, you know, she, she is very much connected with earth and, uh, and children, you know, the beginning of the We Wisdom magazine, and I'll let you Google that. But she, um, so the teaching was imparting information and, and then adding to it, oh, what, what else, you know, how, what can I offer you to then draw out, um, from your own, um, um, uh, from your own experience, from your own life history, from your own wisdom, right? She did, there was a lot of that, from your own wisdom. Um, so for instance, I'll give you a for instance. She's, um, someone, someone has written to her about, and you can tell, so if you're not familiar, this may sound stupid, but here in the United States, very much of the far-right, conservative, evangelical Christians live in the South and very much south, meaning like where I am in Missouri, down, you know, south. Um, and that's often where you find, you know, a literal Bible interpretation. Um, and so she has this letter from a woman who, who's, who's concerned, a letter, a woman writes into her and, and based on Myrtle's response had sent some newspaper clippings and is kind of, um, uh, it, it, kind of, the woman is kind of like confused or distraught a little bit about um, why, what, in because in these articles, someone's talking about this literal translation of the Bible and um, doesn't, and the woman's confused about how do people take this on, this literal thing. So here's Myrtle's response. And this are her words, not mine. You better get out of the South. So she's first thing she says, you better get out of the South. You're likely to slip into their superstitions and hallucinations. No joking. It's foolish for you to spend your time thinking that God tempts man or leads him into temptation by the devil. Um, so she's pretty, that's like kind of the teacher piece, you know, where she's like, here, first, do this, get out of the South, um, which I had, I really kind of had to laugh about because um, it sounds like. I'm like, wow, you'd hear the same thing today. I don't know if that's um, scary or entertaining. Um, but then she moves into, and this is, she's in this, in this letter, it's the literal interpretation of the Bible, specifically around the Lord's Prayer. Um, like people, so this woman is writing in about, well, how do you, what about tempting and evil and the devil and, you know, all of these things that's in the Lord's Prayer. And so her response is to tell, well, you better get out. Um, but then she, she moves into, she starts to use everyday ordinary ways of being. And she equates, you know, if you look at the Lord's Prayer about tempting, right, being tempted, 
um, lead us not into temptation. You know, and she uses the analogy of that we are like small children and that, um, you know, we, um, you know, would we say, you know, and children learn, like we, as we're growing up, we learn by getting ourselves to stand up, by moving around a room, by, you know, touching the chairs that are around there. And, and I'm, you know, and a child is not tempted by the chairs. The, the, you know, the, the child is tempted by just the eagerness to reach out, right? The eagerness to, to just learn, the eagerness of the child to learn their surroundings. Right? So she takes this idea and totally turns it on its head. And again, this teacher person, but then, you know, if you, if you think about, she leaves it with you. And, and me, now I'm into the education piece, the educare, right? The drawing out, because I'm going to go, oh, yeah, what does a small child, you know, the, and just learning to deal with the surroundings. Um, and that's the, the connection that she's making to that, is how do we connect, right? How do we be with what's around us? And how do we expand what we be with what's around us? Um, she doesn't, um, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's that's one of the, um, for me, one of the more, and, and she does that um, in most all of her writings. She, she'll give you a, here's this, right? And now what about that, right? Where she asks you the question to take it on for yourself, which is why she, there are from time to time, you come across a letter where she says, okay, you're not doing the work. So don't write to us anymore. You know, when you've started doing the work, then you can write back. Um, and she's very clear about that. And she's, she says, you know, we'll still hold you in prayer and keep going. Um, but, but unless and until you're willing to do your work, then, um, you know, there's not much for us to do here. So there's an awful lot about, um, there's a lot about Myrtle Fillmore that we, that we, that lots of people don't know. And there's this assumption that she was in some, in many places that, you know, she's, if you're thinking of, let me put it this way, if you're thinking of Myrtle Fillmore in this nice little pillbox hat and pearls, and maybe I said that last week too, yeah, no. Not in it. Um, she was very, um, you know, in many ways direct in her communication, but there was also this, and this is, I think, what's what makes her such a brilliant teacher for us, um, and why it becomes this dangerous single story to think of her as well. She wrote letters about prayer and just prayer and just healing. No, it was much more than that. It was much more than that. If you think about the topics that she was covering right? How many, how many times are you talking with people about, or writing to them, or emails, you know, or blogging about disease, about poverty, about addiction, about unemployment, about the house, you know, houseless people, um, about human rights? Like, how many times are, are we, are you personally engaged in those kind of conversations? She was, right? She was, it was, it wasn't just about me the individual and doing my healing process right she so last week i talked about healing as a two-step process step one to believe so am i believing in process or am i believing in the outcome and my answer is yes depends where i am in the moment right what am i doing and then step two was to be open and receptive to the healing stream of life and this is myrtle's two-step thing um and to be open and receptive to the healing stream of life is, for me, the healing stream of life is everything, right? Just like the child getting comfortable with their surroundings, we do that too. How do I get comfortable with my surroundings? All around me, outside, inside, are these, you know, these, these human condition issues that I may personally be engaged in, you know, houselessness or, um, you know, addiction or unemployment, um, but also everyone around me, right? So how am I being in action to alleviate that suffering, right? So being open and receptive to the healing stream of life is, for me, all of life and where where's the healing stream in that? Like it's there, I have to just find it. And the healing stream of life for me is how do I engage in that stream of life to alleviate suffering? 
And that's the educare part. That's the education is here's, do I know, do I understand the process of affirmative prayer, right? Which is not for today. Um, step one, believe, right? Am I believing in the process of how affirmative prayer works, of how healing works? It's not just our thoughts. It's our thoughts and feelings. In fact, feelings most often come before the thoughts. Science has been demonstrating for a while that we are feeling creatures who think, not the other way around. And we've taught in unity for a long time that your thoughts create your world. And it just didn't sell. It's a piece. So it's this whole, that's the threefold healing, right? Body, mind, spirit, or soul. Sometimes she uses the word soul. So the teaching is pointing us to our inner work. Am I believing in process? Am I believing in outcome? And what is that process, right? And it's affirmative prayer is what it is. Again, a different day, different workshop, different topic. And then step two, being open and receptive. What am I open and receptive to? What am I not, right? Annoying people are around me everywhere. I don't wanna be open and receptive to them. Just a fact, every once in a while. But most days I can because I recognize that there, there's more behind them. There's a world behind their wound, right? But being open and receptive to all that is, that is there. So the joys, the sufferings, the gratitudes, the anger, the frustration, the peacefulness, just all of it. And that whole thing, that whole package of my life is the teaching and the education, right? Not to mention we're in the teacher and student role all the time. And I think that's another piece that Myrtle provided for us, being the student, meaning hitting the streets. Okay, so this is what I've learned. This is what I know. Now let me go, let me go do my homework, right? As the student. Let me go out into the world and do my homework. And sometimes I discover, oh yeah, that I got a that's like a D minus homework grade, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I, cause you know, sometimes being in this human condition can be challenging. But she, the other thing about the teacher of Myrtle Fillmore is that she was, she was disciplined and she was relentless. And by relentless, I don't mean like uh, doggedly relentless and being harsh. She just was, you commit. Commitment was a huge deal. Being disciplined, being committed and doing it for peace of mind, peace of mind, health in the body, and knowledge of truth. Those are, when she talks about a mathematical equation, that's what she's talking about, these three things. Peace of, the, peace of mind, um, uh, health in the body, and knowledge of truth. Those are the three, the three things that part of her mathematical equation. So, whew. Hopefully got a little bit more about Myrtle. And she didn't always get it right, just saying. I talk about Myrtle this way because I want to bring her down off the pedestal. I want people to know that our co-founder was just like you and me, was working or was learning and working her stuff out and disciplined and committed. She's probably a little more disciplined and committed than I am on some days, um, but not to put her in a box there's always something more, right? There's always more beyond, there's more world beyond. So I wanna take the idea um, of this story, right? We hear the word story and it's gotten a bad rap at times, like, oh, there she is in her story again. Ah, oh, I've heard that story 85 times. Go to the therapist, I can't hear it anymore. You know, like the word story just gets a, a bad rap. Um, but I want us to know, one, the danger of a single story, assuming I know all the pieces, but also the power of story, because each one of us is a story, right? It's like a molecule that makes up the story of all humanity, of all life. So how I make sense of my story, how I make sense of your story um, is necessary for what we would like our world to be. Um, so I can either be part of the immune system of the world, or I can be part of the disease of the world. We get to choose. 
So I want to take that idea of story and let's take that into meditation. And if you're comfortable, you can close your outer eyes or you can just lower your gaze. Whatever's comfortable, right, for you. What is comfortable for you? For some people, it is to close their, close their eyes and, and look within. For others, that's that adds anxiety. And we need to know that there is a, to assume that to close our eyes and just look within is the same for everybody. And it's not. So we close our eyes if we're comfortable. We lower our gaze to something in front of us if that's comfortable. Or we can even gaze on someone that's in our little boxes here. And know that in the beginning was a sacred story. In the beginning was a sacred story that is you. In the beginning was a sacred story that is you, that is fully human and fully divine. In the beginning was a story that is you, that is fully human in a body. In a body that breathes, that has a heart that can think, that has emotions, that experiences the world through taste and touch, through sight, through sound, through aromas. So pause for a moment. Pause for a moment and acknowledge the fullness of your humanity. All of it, the good, the bad, the messed up, the broken, the fabulousness, messed up, the awe, the wonder, the unique, unrepeatable configuration that is you. In the beginning was a sacred story that it is you. Fully human and fully divine. Fully divine, bringing forward the truth of love, of wisdom, of intelligence in this physical form bringing forward the principle that there is one presence and one power by whatever name you may call it. That you bring forward in this physical form through kindness, through compassion, through listening, through caring, through silliness. Through support, for, through acknowledging, through accepting, through understanding. These are all expressions, limited expressions of that infinite one presence and one power. That is, we need our bodies, our minds, our spirits to bring forward. That is how we know the one presence and one power. And even as we bring words to being fully human, fully divine,
take a moment and reflect on who you are beyond the stories you tell of yourself. Who are you beyond the stories that are told about you? Who are you beyond the temporality of your body? Who are you beyond imposed social roles? Who are you beyond your ancestral bloodlines? Who are you beyond self-image, beyond self-authorship? Who are you beyond right this moment? Consider yourself in this moment. How you came to this place in this time right now. And who are you beyond that? So take a moment in the quiet and just be with who are you beyond right now? Ask your heart that question, be still with it. And then when you are ready, focus your attention on the faces you see online. When you are ready, If your eyes are closed, when you are ready, gently open and find a face to gaze upon. And you can gently go box by box in any order you want. <laughs> Remembering that there is a world behind the eyes that you see. And so it is, and so it is, amen.